So how did I get to that point where I can take on the title of the CTO advisor? Early in my IT career, I cut my teeth in many of the same places that some of us cut our teeth. When I had hair, I got my Novell certification. For those of us that don't know what Novell was, it was AD before AD was AD. That was my first certification. Uh, I spent, you know, typical career ladder, went from server administration to network administration, kind of a general, generalist. I think this region of the world, we're pretty good. You guys are pretty good at knowing a lot of topics and being extremely broad. So I think you can relate and kind of the depth of knowledge across a bunch of different topics. That led to an opportunity for me to take a job at Lockheed Martin as a chief program architect for the U.S. Housing Department. Pretty interesting role. I get to see all the different technologies and how they align to that organization's mission. Uh, took me away from the day-to-day -day data center uh, thing. I slowly noticed that my keyboarding skills uh, were going away, and one day I showed up at, in the data center, and the engineers looked at me at this, with this curious look, like, "What are you doing here? And why are you touching that keyboard?" And they didn't realize I still had an administrative account, and that went away really quick. So that that marked a change in my <laughs> IT career. And I think a change for the better, for the most part. It, it, it brought me here uh, after Lockheed Martin. I went back into a, well, no, I wouldn't even say back. I went forward into even deeper down this business uh, hole. I went to PwC, which is formerly known as PricewaterhouseCoopers. I was a management consultant. Looked at problems a lot differently than I had been before. Even with Lockheed Martin, it was someone would set the business agenda, uh, the goals, I would create a solution that would meet those goals. You know, a goal would be, we want to reduce the amount of travel that our uh, business takes. So obvious solution to that is high definition video, Cisco, uh, high definition video conferences and solutions around that. Pretty much a lot of what I did in the past. At Lockheed Martin, I'd do a, I'd do a, trade study on NFS versus iSCSI versus Fiber Channel. At PwC, I found that the conversations were much different. Instead of talking about iSCSI versus NFS versus Fiber Channel, it was, should we outsource all of this to a managed service provider and let them figure out the whole transport issue on a storage perspective? It gave me a, a, a truly different view of <laughs> IT and the value that IT adds. We'll talk a little bit about my education path. I don't normally put my education on the introduction slab, uh, slide, but I think it's relevant. I have a BA in computing, so pseudo computer science degree, but typical heavy computer science, programming, Java, uh, Bee tree, the, the typical stuff you get in a computer science degree. Then I went back to school and got my master's in science in IT project management, a mix between the business side and the technology side. And I'll talk about how that adds value to my career in a little bit. So let's talk about the opportunity. We can think of it as a challenge, but I prefer to think of it as an opportunity. I think there's disruption happening in the industry today. One of the first things is that convergence. We saw that slide uh, Nathan shared about hyperconvergence and the value that you're achieving through hyperconvergence. One of the side effects of this value or the things that we don't like to admit to when we talk about value that's driven via convergence and hyperconvergence is the breaking down of silos and the reduction of the need for manual labor. Scott will deliver in part of our community session a little bit later. He'll talk to through you know the value of uh, automation versus button pushing. When we automate things, when we collapse the infrastructure into a single platform, that reduces complexity. When we reduce complexity, 
we add redundancy. And that redundancy can be at the full-time employee level. We need to, the organizations will start to look at how they shift resources from day-to-day -day storage administrators. You know, our hyperconvergence friends will always say, you know what, you no longer need 10 storage administrators to, uh, to manage your storage. Well, what happens to those jobs? What happens to those people? There's people behind these. One of the bitter truths that I discovered when I was at PwC is that some of the decisions we help companies make has in, in an impact to real people lives. And I think that's one of the things that I developed a passion for is saying, you know what, these are highly skilled people. These are people who figure out multi-million dollar challenges. When you think about some of the things that we do, the migration from a physical landscape to a virtual landscape, making sure applications have the quality of services they need to deliver the business value. These are highly complex problems. When you look at NSX and delivery uh, micro segmentation and uh, virtualized networking and delivering and extending the capability, these are great, great challenges that require a tremendous amount of skill. People with that type of skill do not just dissipate. That's, that innate ability to solve those problems, I think that's a transferable skill set into some other areas, and we're going to talk about some of those other areas. Outsourcing. Outsourcing is, you know, we went through uh, in the period of the 80s and 90s, this huge move to outsourcing. Outsourcing hasn't gone away. Businesses, not necessarily to save money, but to drive business value, are looking at outsourcing as a thing very much so. The cloud. The cloud is changing the business model for a lot of vendors. I don't think we need to look any further than a Dell and EMC merger to see the pressure that these companies are on under to uh, morph into something that organizations can get true value out of. And uh, the Dell EMC merger is an example or a symptom of what's happening to the larger industry. I know a lot of us are a little bit of pins and needles. We all have friends at both Dell, EMC, VMware, we're wondering what's gonna to happen to their jobs and their careers. It's, but in all that challenge, it's opportunity. Because if you think about it, I think this business problem that I'm trying to allude to is no different than any other engineering challenge. These are massively complex distributed systems. When we talk, even when we talk about adding hyperconvergence, well, you bring in hyperconvergence, containers, cloud, and cloud native applications that are managed across a, a, another a managed service provider's infrastructure, your infrastructure, these hybrid infrastructures. These are complex that we we're. At, on service, we thought we were reducing complexity, but we're ad actually adding complexity. We're adding a layer of abstraction, and someone has to figure out how all those systems interact from a way that we're not accustomed to. Me and Scott will talk upon that a little bit later in the community session. So one of the things that, if you follow me on Twitter, one of the things that I did that was very abrupt and interesting was that I quit my job without having a new job lined up. One of the brutal realities of working as a management consultant is that you work or you travel 40, I think in 2013, I traveled 40 weeks out of the 52 week year, Monday through Thursday or Sunday through Thursday, every week for two years. And you still work a, you still bill 40 hours a week and you still work an additional 12 to 13 hours on top of the travel. I got to do some really cool stuff. I, there was a, uh, a financial services company that had got breached. They provided credit card transaction services. Uh, they were going through what they call that their PCI audit because they got breached. If they didn't pass the audit, they would not go on, continue as a going concern. This is a Fortune 500 company. So a Fortune 500 company had to remediate 
their environment in six months. So it's literally about three years of work. Math is math. You can't squeeze three years of work in six months. How do you solve this business challenge? Immensely, immensely challenging. Or I like to share this story. The, I throw a really big Super Bowl party, 30 to 40 people. You know, the Super Bowl is big in the US. And this event, I was leading the, the patch management remediation program for this customer. And it was Sunday. We thought we had it all settled. The audit was going to be the next week. We're good. I have 30, 35 people in the next room. I get a call from our partner saying, you know what, Keith, we found 300 servers we, weren't, we didn't know about. They had very, very poor service management. And this is why they got breached. This is why they're in trouble. So we, we found 300 uh, N-scope servers we didn't know about. I need you to jump on the plane, come solve the problem. I'm like, well, hold up, hold up. One, that's a serious problem. That's not going to get solved in one day. And two, I got 35 people in the next room that I'm entertaining. The game hasn't even started yet. You get the, th the drift. That's the life of a management consultant. You get to do really cool stuff, but it's a high stress job that requires a lot of you. So I, you know, I, I came to it. I said, you know what? This is not going to be my long term deal. I'm not going to do this forever. What better way to transition to a new career than to use the community and kind of crowdsource my job search? So I gave a couple of months notice or a month notice and I announced to Twitter I was looking for a job. I got a ton of inquiries. Some lessons learned from that, that search that I think is valuable lessons for this conversation. As a result of my management consulting experience, vendors love the fact that I solved problems at that higher abstraction level. The thing that they don't generally have, they have very good, very, very good architects and engineers, pre-sales engineers, but they didn't have a depth of people that really understood the boardroom. What I also found out, to my chagrin, is that they still wanted deep technical skills. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, people want 10 years of OpenStack experience. <laughs> okay, that's quite impossible, but it's the same deal. People wanted the deep technical, they wanted the deep uh, business skill, and they also wanted the deep technical skill. If you remember my earlier comment when I went to the data center, the engineers kind of looked at me crazy, and that was four years ago. That's what that was four years previous. So when I got asked the question, you know, walk me through writing a bad shell script, the last script I wrote was a Windows batch file, so I was kind of taken aback. Valuable lesson. So the output of that is that there's a balance. If you enjoy being an engineer, I'm not telling you to go out and become a management facility and abandon your engineering discipline. There's opportunities in between. If you want to stay technical, you can most definitely stay technical, but don't let this opportunity that the, while the industry is changing, don't let that opportunity pass you by to add business skill to your repository. So what are these skills and how do you gain them? You know, from a high level, some of these skills are obvious. We work with these people every day, the change management folks, the people in finance that figure out the financing of a project, whether it's OpEx, CapEx, the difference between the two, why would we choose one over another? We work with the service management people who uh, understand, you know, there's this great story. Well, I don't know if it's great from Netflix's perspective, but it's a great lesson to learn. Christmas 2012, Netflix uh, experienced the outage. That outage was a result of the last load balancers being updated on AWS's side. No, no one's fault, you know, the, it was routine maintenance for AWS, it had to happen. But that interaction with the on-site application, Netflix's specific application, caused a chain, chain reaction that resulted in an outage. That's a great distributed system problem. It's also a great business problem or a change management problem. Inside of our own organization, we may catch that type of uh, change or that type of issue because the knowledge is all internal to our organization. 
how do we figure out how to do those things as our domain spreads across an extracted data center? So these are, I think, still fun challenges, but how do we obtain these skills? I think I have four recommendations. And by the way, I'm going a little fast, so if you have questions, raise your hand, ask a question at any point forward. Won't mind to take questions at all live. Four different options. Get involved in projects, propose a new project, get formal cha changing, or the nuclear option, which is switch jobs, which I think is a very good option. We'll get into why. So get involved in projects. Two advantages to getting involved in projects. It improves your visibility. I think I still run into this in my day job. My day job, I'm a SAP infrastructure architect. And you may say, Keith, your handle used to be at Virtualized Geek. What are you doing as an SAP infrastructure architect? Simple answer, that's where the money is at. Follow the money. <laughs> I, I support a, an environment that has hundreds of itanium, HP Itanium servers running on HP UX. That, that's the furthest thing from VMware vSphere. However, it's mission critical to the organization. If you ever have the chance, and I see this a lot in organizations where engineers can be a little fearful of getting involved in mission critical workloads because of the visibility and what happens when they go down. The reason why organizations pour so much money into mission critical applications is because it's mission critical. The reason why I chose to be an SAP infrastructure architect is because in my organization, SAP is mission critical. It was a unique opportunity for me to take SAP as it is today in Itanium and move it to, you know, look down a road. There, you know, there's SAP HANA, uh, there's uh, the retirement of HP UX as a operating system that's supported in another eight or nine years, give or take, depending on who you listen to. I'm not a technical resource anymore. You know, I, I couldn't tell you how to even spell HPUX. Is it HPUX? Is it HPUX? I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, I couldn't tell you how to create a, I still don't know how to, I know logically how you might create a batch file, but I couldn't log into an HPUX system and create that file. I couldn't tell you how to configure, even look at the stats of a, uh, of, a, of the storage I.O. for HP UX system. However, my role is to sit in between the business and the engineers. So when the business comes to me and says, you know, Keith, we need to buy eight VMAXs to support, I'm exaggerating, but not by much. We need to buy eight uh, VMAXs to support 30 workloads because that's what our vendor told us we need for the solution. And then when I go to the engineer and I tell the engineer that, they give me that obvious look like, you know what, if you want to spend the money, I'll take the money and spend the money, but I don't want to manage eight VMAXs for, that's just, not only is it a waste, it's impractical. It, I just don't want the, the complexity. So I take, I sit in between those two organizations and I negotiate uh, when a engineer, when we have a project like SAP HANA on the landscape, and the business says, you know what, we're gonna do this massive transformation with the same infrastructure guys and with the same number of guys, I'm the one that goes into the VP's office and says, and say, look, I, you're crazy, this, this isn't gonna happen. I need to give these people more resources so that we can have a successful project. So the architect title is changing. It's no longer a, and this is, you know, I've had this time, this candid conversation with my organization and other organizations. The architect title is morphing from a person who is third level, fourth level engineering to someone who really understands the business challenges, can have the conversation, they can walk into a director of, of finance or a director or VP of finance's office have a business level conversation, take, those, take that conversation and translate it into engineer speak. 
not necessarily creating the solution themselves, but being the proxy between those two environments. Getting involved in projects is a great way to become, to get introduced to that world, because it can be jarring. You know, it's, it, I like to share the story, uh, me and Justin, a few months ago on the Green Brown Bear did a developing a business case mock where I created, I was the IT guy, I created the business case. Justin was the business owner, the CEO, and I had to present the business case to, to Justin. The business, the technology project was a data center network switch refresh. From a engineer perspective, if we have 10 year old switches, we understand instantly what we need, why we need to update, upgrade the data center switch technology. They're 10 year old switches. So I, I don't want to support an environment that has 10 year old switches. But if I go into a CEO's office and say, you know what, I want $3 million to upgrade switches, he's thinking, you're asking me for three million. The warehouse is asking me for three million to upgrade uh, the forklifts. I understand why I need to upgrade the forklifts. I don't understand why I need to, uh, I get email, uh, I can still print. What exactly is the problem? So proposing a new project is a way to help you understand how to deliver the business value. You can work with the folks in your finance department, you can work with the folks in your portfolio management uh, group to understand what your organization values, what are the key drivers, the key goals, and align that to the network switch upgrade. I, I highly recommend you guys go take a look at that uh, video from the B. Brown Bag series. We go into a good number of detail around how, what, what are the criteria and, and what's the requirements for proposing and getting the project approved and how to make sure it aligns to your organizational goals. Then we'll get into this a little bit more. It introduces you to the uh, project management concepts. So I kind of combine two slides into one. We'll, so I'll gloss over the other one, we'll just cover it now. So this was, you know, get involved in the project, propose a project, more specifically, even before you propose a new project, getting involved in the project is a great idea. If there's an existing project, you don't have to jump into the whole, you know what, let me get our, into our portfolio management system and, and tear through justification for a new project and go before a project management board and introduce the concept and defend, uh, the project as if I'm going in for my VCDX defense. You, you don't have to jump into that, to the deep end of the pool. You can simply just get involved in the existing project. This is something that I see in a lot of organizations or a lot, with a lot of engineers, the fear to get involved in something new. You know, I, I create, I, I'm an automation engineer and I love automation. Might be the feedback I hear and I don't care about what's going on now. I really like what I do today. And I don't want to do anything different. That's a surefire way to get caught up in the changes that's happening within the industry. Raise your hand. Don't be scared to raise your hand and say, you know what, that adjacent part, it may not be automation. It could be something related to automation. Let's say it's an NSX project because everyone has some type of micro-segmentation project going on. You can add value as an automation engineer to that type of project. Don't be scared to raise your hand and volunteer to add value to an existing project. Formal training. I said I'd talk a little bit about my educational path and why I chose what I chose. I like, you know, I, I hinted on it earlier, I like structure. I was originally certified in Netware 4.1. The great thing about certifications is add structure to training. And as engineers, and we look at this more, what well, seems to be a little bit more abstract, the business part seems to be more abstract. If I wanted to work, learn, today if I wanted to learn NSX, a great way to do that is to 
go for a VCP in, 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 in NSX. There's training material, it's very technical, there's points that I have to learn. It's not very complicated to understand what I need to do to learn NSX. The same thing for uh, vSphere 6.0 or vRealize. If I wanted to learn these technologies, the path forward is pretty simple. But if I say, Keith, I'm, how do I learn contract negotiation? What's the certification for contract negotiation? Well, there's, I don't think there's a contract for uh, a uh, certification for contract negotiation. That's a little bit more abstract of a concept. So formal training is a great option for learning these, or not technologies, these topics I'm telling you you need to go out and get. The, the options range. You can go to a full university, go my path, and get a degree in IT project management, MBA. I'm seeing a lot of architects now with uh, MBAs. I think our good, good friend at Ruby, Chris Wall, I think he has an MBA. Uh, and it adds uh, a great deal of depth to your skill. That is not necessarily the path for everyone, especially if you don't have an undergraduate degree. Another uh, option is a certificate program, a master's level certificate program. Some people will be surprised to know that you don't need a, a lot of universities don't require you have a bachelor's degree to get a master's certificate program, which is a, and at this point in most of our careers, if we're attending VMUG user groups, we probably, if we haven't gotten our degree at this point, uh, it may, the, the value of that at this point in our career may be questionable. But there's most definitely value, and you have the ability, I think if you're in this room, you have the ability to grasp the material in a certificate, a master certificate level course that might have three or four different courses to teach you a specific topic. I've talked about contract negotiation. You can find master's level certificate programs that focus on contract negotiation. And then, you could take bite-sized courses at something like what we call in the U.S. as a junior college, a two-year university in which you take focused courses on the topic that you want. Let's say you don't want to do a whole uh, contract negotiation course. You can take a negotiating course. Uh, uh, and then even tangent courses like psychology and so forth. And then the final option, you can just get a new job. The, I think it's a, some of us will be surprised at the, how relevant our skill set is to a job that's tangent to something that we do today. If you work with a service management per person today, if you work with an auditor, if you work with a finance person, you from a high level understand their job. If you shadow them for a couple of months, you could probably, especially at the depending on the responsibilities, you could probably do their job. Don't be fearful of going out and applying, whether it's internally or externally, for a job that you don't do directly today, and it's not a technology job. Configuration management, I, you know, I, I count on that, it's a pet peeve of mine, is, an, is a great example of a job that most of us would be able to do because we work with configuration management people every day. We know what they do, it's just a matter of learning the details, the in and out details of their job. That adds a great, great business skill to our repository. I went out and chose to become a management consultant. That was like the nuclear option. You know, you can become a, you can go work with a vendor, become, go, get onto the pre-sales team, on a vendor team. Pre-sales engineers pick up an awful lot of skill from just the sales process. That's a great option. You can become a consultant or a management consultant. You get exposed to so many different problems in such a short time. It's also a great option. So let's catch the conference up and hopefully get back on track. Let's close out. In summary, things are changing. Whether we want them to or not, I think this golden age of the silos, getting certification, having an easy skills inventory to maintain, 
those times are here. Silos are getting broken down. The industry is changing. We have to change with the industry. I think I highlighted from my own personal example, business and tech skills combined together is a killer combination. I don't think you need to look any further than the example of Netflix and how that complexity of moving to the cloud requires more than just technical capability. And most importantly, if anything that you take away from this session today, I want you to go out and do something different. If you've been doing the same thing in your everyday job for the past five, six years, change. I'm telling you, from personal experience and helping companies make these tough decisions that impact everyone in this room, that if you're doing the same thing every day for the past five years, you have a target on your back. That's, that's the biggest thing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Look forward to talking to you guys outside uh, the, the presentation.